You are listening to Climate Now. I'm Katherine Gorman. And I'm James Lawler. This episode is part two of a two-episode series on the NASA Orbiting Carbon Observatory missions to measure atmospheric carbon dioxide from space. In part one, we heard from OCO science team lead, Dr. David Crisp, about the painstaking journey to get OCO into space. In this episode, we are going to discuss the science coming out of the OCO missions. We'll include pieces from our conversation with Dr. David Crisp that you didn't hear in the first episode. But we'll start off this episode discussing the OCO instruments and data with Dr. Anne-Marie Eldering, who is the Deputy Project Scientist for OCO2 and the Project Scientist for OCO3. She received her PhD in Environmental Engineering Science from Caltech in 1994, with a focus on air pollution and its impacts on visibility in Los Angeles. And she's been at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, since 1999. Dr. Eldering, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We really appreciate it. No, I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. Anne-Marie, we ask all of our guests the same question first. How did you get to where you are today in your career? OCO is an amazing project. How did you become part of it? And it really was kind of a set of serendipitous events following my nose. So as you mentioned, I came to California to study air pollution. And after I finished my PhD, I was a professor for a few years, didn't find that a great fit. And through a friend, I found an opportunity at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory as a summer faculty and then learned more about what they were doing with remote sensing of Earth's atmosphere. And once I got to JPL and got involved in some projects and met some of the people, I knew I had found my home. So that's how I joined. I joined JPL in 1999, working inside a project to measure air pollution from space. I started technical work. How does light go through Earth's atmosphere? How is it going to interfere with this air pollution experiment? And we got that launched in 2004 and started studying air pollution with this instrument. Then I got involved with some other instruments looking at water vapor temperature, doing technical work on the teams. But bit by bit, I spoke up at meetings and I tried to organize our people and someone recognized that they could give me a management job and I wouldn't run away. And in 2010, the OCO2 mission was getting kicked off. The original OCO mission that didn't have a number attached had uh, failed in the launch in 2009. It did not launch successfully. So in 2010, NASA approved the effort to rebuild that as OCO2. And a couple key folks had gotten involved elsewhere, so they needed new faces. So I got invited and joined in 2010 as the deputy project scientist. So can you tell us about your work on OCO? If you could just describe what what it is that you work on, and then what are you doing day to day with this amazing project? So the highest level, our objective is to get precise measurements across the globe so we can understand how carbon dioxide moves between the Earth's atmosphere, land, and ocean. And the way that's achieved, these instruments are looking at sunlight that gets reflected off of Earth's surface back to the instrument. And when you, if you measure that light, that reflected sunlight, with very fine separation of wavelengths of light, you can see gas absorption features in great detail. So we can use the light measurements and how light measurements change to actually find out about how much carbon dioxide is changing around the globe. And we're actually collecting 10 kilometer wide or six mile wide swath of data, 15 orbits a day. But, it, but carbon dioxide changes in response to the, to the natural carbon cycle are slow enough and broad enough that you can learn about it from those measurements. This sensor, where is it physically in space? Is it like a, you know, like a grapefruit? Is it like a ball field? What, what is it? What exactly are we Does talking about? Does it look like about? the Hubble? Like, <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> great, great question. So... So OCO2 is uh, an instrument that's on its own satellite because we call it a free flyer. And it is the size of like a really big refrigerator. Of course, it's got some big solar panels sticking out on the side. So the overall footprint of it is a bit bigger, but the heart and guts of the instrument is a big ridge. Hmm. Fridge with wings. Yeah, fridge with wings, exactly. And it's flying around 700 kilometers above Earth, which is a typical place where satellites fly around 
in what they call a sun synchronous orbit. So we fly over uh, your local location about the same time every time we fly overhead. And OCO3 is a different beast. So we, we, when we rebuilt OCO2 after the failed launch, everyone recognized that if we had a problem again, it would be smart to just have a duplicate in the closet in case we needed it. OCO2 got to space safely so we worked with NASA and found a way to put the spare one up on the International Space Station. The idea that people should know is it's, it's kind of like Legos in space. There's a known defined interface that you plug into with power, cooling fluid, and data transfer. So lots of people build these rectangular boxes of instrumentation with that same interface and plug into the experimental module. So OCO3 is like a giant refrigerator with a connection face on one end of it, and it got launched up on a SpaceX Dragon, and the robot arm grabbed it out of the Dragon, handed it to another robot arm, and then it plugged it into the GEMIF facility through that interface. So OCO3 is like OCO2 without the solar panel wings kind of built so it can work on the ISS. If, if my understanding is correct, the OCO2 is the same as the OCO3, you use the word looking several times. Is it visual data? What is being collected and by what? Can you tell me what the raw sort of stuff is? Well, after ones and zeros come back, the first thing we assemble that into are light levels. And we've got three, what we call bands. So three groupings of light that we measure. The first one is in the what they call the oxygen A band, but you can think about it as a wavelength that your eye could even see and when it's cloudy, you really notice it in these wavelengths. So we have a recording of about a thousand channels of light in that oxygen band. And then there's two other bands. One's called the weak carbon dioxide. So it's a place where carbon dioxide absorbs weakly. And the strong carbon dioxide where carbon dioxide absorbs strongly. Again, about a thousand colors of light and a thousand colors of light in the strong. So those two, you can imagine the strong one will get saturated out by the carbon dioxide absorption, but the weak one less so. So putting those two together really lets us understand carbon dioxide throughout the atmosphere. And when we look, there's a stripe, our data collects our eight footprints across. They sum up to 10 kilometers about, and three bands of light in each of those eight footprints. And then that just sweeps along. And so you get this continuous collecting of eight footprints each of them roughly two by two kilometers. To what degree do weather patterns play a role in obscuring the amount of CO2 that might be emitted or captured by the actual surface of the earth? Weather is important. So when you want to look at this big picture carbon cycle, right? There's, there's things that are so massive, you notice them regardless of accounting for the weather or not. And things like that are spring arrives, in the northern latitudes, you go from trees with no leaves to trees with big, green, leafy things. That takes so much carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, it's just obvious in the data. But if you want to say, you know, was this May a more active spring than last May, you're not going to be able to tell that apart by just looking at the carbon dioxide fields. You have to say, Let's account for the winds and the movement in last May and the winds and the movement in this May, because if the differences are subtle, if the differences are just a part per million of carbon dioxide, which is one part, one part per million out of the 400 we usually have is a, not a huge change, you've got to account for weather with those changes. So when everybody was talking about COVID and lockdowns and reduced emissions, we couldn't say anything about how COVID affected the carbon dioxide until we had backed out the weather effects of this spring relative to 2019 spring relative to 2018 spring or 2020 relative to other years. So for many problems, you have to account for the weather to make sense of what you're learning about carbon dioxide exchange of the forest and the oceans. Accounting for weather sounds like a very complicated thing do and maybe it's maybe i'm not thinking about it right but the idea of like like wind speeds are so variable on such a local on such a localized level that it would seem to be like just a massive amount of data one would have to 
capture over a significant period of time to be able to run that kind of calculation to back out this May versus last May? When we're solving a very local problem, like one of our colleagues will, was looking at data, particularly around power plants, how much a power plant is emitting. He needs those winds, he needs them in direction, he needs them in strength, but for a very small region. So that kind of data he'll get from like a, a weather forecasting tool for that region. For the global picture, we basically work very closely with the same types of teams who do large scale weather and climate modeling. So for example, at the Goddard Space Flight Center, there's the Goddard GMAO, Meteorological and an Analysis Office. So they run large scale complex models that integrate all the best weather data you can get and have the best atmospheric flow, convection, dynamics. And, and then you integrate carbon dioxide into these types of models and take care of the winds. And what did we find about COVID differences this year, that COVID caused differences in emissions? There's some nice work that came out of GMAO, and they definitely could see the reduced emissions across Europe, North America, and Asia. And there were predictions that about 7% emissions reduction had occurred based on fuels and things like that. And you did see atmospheric change that seemed consistent with that once you accounted for other variables. So I'd love to talk a little bit about the historical lens on the work that OCO2 and OCO3 have been able to do. How have we been able to change our understanding of the fluxes in the carbon cycle in a way that we didn't have before after we have these, these amazing and so powerful tools to, to assist us with that? One of the ways we've changed our understanding is in... Uh, Understanding why the carbon cycle has such variability, especially over land, in, a, in re different regions of the world. It used to be we would talk about the tropics as if the tropics was one thing, but it's not, right? You have South America tropical region, African tropical region, your Indonesia. And what we were able to do with the Orbiting Carbon Observatory is observe the El Nino and the response to El Nino and see that changes were driven by different factors in different regions. Indonesia had big fires, and so a lot of carbon dioxide went into the atmosphere from that region because of those fires. Africa had a lot of heat, so the hot temperatures made leaves decay more, and there's extra carbon release because of that. In South America, you had the driest conditions you had had in a long time, so the plants just didn't really grow much and therefore didn't take the carbon dioxide out. So there was more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because of the drought. So now you can't talk about the tropics. You could talk about drought driven behavior in the tropics, heat driven behavior in the tropics, fire driven behavior, and see how the different regions behave. And so when we try to predict how will the future unfold as climate evolves, we can start to now look at the more regional behaviors like South America might you know, end up with more of these drought conditions and it's going to behave this way, but in a region that has more high temperature occurrences, you'll have this behavior. So it's, it's breaking down things into more regional behaviors, which helps you, you want to really understand why stuff's happening. So are the plants not growing as much? Are the plants growing for a shorter period of time? Are the plants dying out because of the heat? And then that helps you understand why carbon cycle might change in climate. And if you want to think about how the responses are, need to be developed, you need to kind of know these types of details. We also talked with David Crisp, the science team lead for the OCO missions about these changes. We knew that less carbon dioxide was absorbed by the Earth during an El Nino, but we didn't know why. And all three of these theories, oh, plants are shutting down. We thought that was one theory. Oh, plants are respiring more than they're, they're photosynthesizing. We thought that was a theory. Oh, there's fire. We thought that was a theory. No, it's all three of them. It's a more complicated system than we thought. And then we thought, you know, in 2016, as the, carbon, as the El Nino started to wane and started to drop back to normal, we thought we're going to be able to start watching the system recover. And then once again, the tropical forest of the world would be the lungs of the planet, which would be taking in all of the carbon dioxide. Never happened. 
What we saw, and then what we traced back all the way back to the beginning of the GOSAT era, was that the tropics have slowly been losing their ability to absorb carbon dioxide since the turn of the century, at least. So that in 2015 and 2016, they were net sources of CO2. But what we're seeing is a system that's just barely holding its own, okay? So the tropics are not where the CO2 is going. Where is it going? Well, we started seeing something else we didn't really expect. Across the Northern Hemisphere in particular, and also in the, in the cone of, of South America, the basically Argentina and Chile going down there, we started seeing stronger absorption of carbon dioxide than we had imagined. And we saw those over a larger fraction of the year than we expected. And what we think is going on is that climate change is driving these regions with longer growing seasons, warmer temperatures, and things are growing faster. And that was a fascinating thing to actually measure. We sort of knew that this was going on from the ground-based measurements, but what was its spatial extent? For example, what was going on in, in Siberia? We had almost no measurements there, right? So now with the space-based sensors, we could see the whole boreal region, the whole Arctic region, the whole northern hemisphere, and see how it was responding to climate change and how the carbon emissions were locked in step with that climate change. And we've learned a tremendous amount about the coupling between the climate and the carbon cycle over the last couple of years. But we've got so much more to learn. So is the natural carbon cycle, this increased uptake, allowing us to emit more, or is this plateauing? How does this work? As our emissions have gone from just a few billion tons of carbon every year to now 40 billion tons of carbon every year, the land biosphere and the oceans have been tracking us, absorbing about half on average. We don't really know why. My favorite theory at the moment is that the northern hemisphere lands, the high northern latitude lands, are absorbing more and more as time goes on. The tropics are kind of holding their own at the moment. We're seeing that uh, basically expanding over time. It, it's not just expanding, though. We're also seeing more disturbances in those areas. Enormous fires across Siberia, enormous fires across Alaska. What fraction of the carbon dioxide, you know, that's being emitted by those fires versus what's being absorbed by the rest of the forest? Well, you know, the forests are winning and they're absorbing more carbon dioxide and they're actually still growing. And that's really, really great news because the tropics aren't helping. Meanwhile, the ocean's just chugging along, doing its thing. As the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere increases, more and more gets absorbed into the ocean. Looking to the future, we were curious whether these observations could be used to pinpoint drivers of emissions more precisely. So we asked Anne-Marie if they were taking the CO2 data and overlaying it with other data, such as tree cover loss, land color, or temperature layers to see if there was any relationship. We have many different scientists who are involved in our science teams, and they have a, a wide variety of tools. For example, one of our teammates is an expert in geostatistical analysis. So he tries to say, if I bring all that ancillary information, can I understand what the driver is? And he's had some success now in showing what drivers are important in what regions of the world. Other folks are using those global models I mentioned that integrate winds. And you can also assimilate or integrate many different measurement sets. Typically, they take carbon dioxide and maybe SIF data. SIF is solar-induced fluorescence. So the instruments like ours and others that measure in the near-infrared, they there's a place you see light showing up. And the only explanation for that light is that plants gave it off while they were doing for, uh, photosynthesis. So it's a measure related to photosynthesis. And what is the resolution? I, I know you mentioned 12, um, 12 square kilometers. Each little footprint is sort of two kilometers by two kilometers, but these modeling groups are using tools that are generally two degrees by two degrees or 200 kilometers by 200 kilometers. So we, that's why we, we use the word regional. I'm not telling you about how the plants responded in the state of Colorado, but I might tell you about the western the U.S., the central U.S., and the eastern U.S., or something like that. 
right now on Earth, companies, countries are all trying to meet various targets, some more seriously than others. And as of now, the only real way we know whether someone is meeting their targets or not is through self-reporting. This tool is actually potentially a verifier of how much CO2 is actually being released by this metropolis or by this country or, or by this company even at, at, at a specific enough degree of resolution. My question is, how close are we to a situation where the OCO project can be that verifier of earthly claims? We're not there yet, but we're certainly taking steps that we think move us in that direction. And that was not our stated goal. It is the science community's goal. And I think between our work and what we see in line or what we see planned for development in the years ahead, we're, we're really working in that direction. And I'm going to give you two little tidbits of what we're doing. And then let me tell you a teaser of where the world's heading. We have a team who's trying to participate in the global stock take that's part of gathering of information to feed into COP26 and this whole discussion about carbon releases from all the countries. So their goal is to create an estimate of carbon release across the globe that feeds into this stock take. For our listeners who may not know, the Global Carbon Stock Take is a collective assessment of the world's progress towards achieving the long-term goals of the Paris Agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The first global stock take is going to take place from 2021 to 2023, and it'll be repeated every five years thereafter. The results of the assessment are going to help inform countries on how they should increase climate action. What we sense is this integration of information about what was emitted and what the plants took up and released. So it's not like one country's emissions come out in one color and we can just see that specifically. It's all mixed together. So the the first thing is just to estimate the carbon release from particular regions of the world, but then it has to be divvied up into natural system versus emissions. Separately, we're starting to take measurements, particularly with OCO3, that are more focused over urban areas. And for those, we can try to get city level emission estimates. So that's something more closely related to the question about is this country reducing or growing or changing in the way that they had planned. But our data collects are somewhat limited. OCO3 only lasts for three years. And for places that are growing slowly, it's very hard to find a trend in three years. So there's going to be some limits on what we do. But the Europeans have a plan that are moving towards putting satellites in space that will nearly map the whole world. And they'll have two or three of these satellites each day mapping the globe with carbon dioxide. And their measurement is expected to actually be a bit more precise than ours. So if you have that type of data, you're really going to have the kind of information that can feed into the questions you were asking. But we're not, we're not there yet. We're climbing that mountain, but we're only just getting out of the foothills. When do you think we have that information? Like, when do you think we can say last year emissions in America were X? This is all just my idea. This is not uh, my work-sponsored input. I think, I mean, I think... The Europeans want to have those satellites in space in 2025. I would think by 2030, we're going to start to be arguing over de the details rather than the basics, which in a decade for space scientists, it's like, oh, that's right around the corner. Like <laughs> everything we do takes so long, <laughs> like a decade's quite achievable. <laughs> In our conversation with David Crisp, he went into further detail on where this research is headed and how it could help us fight climate change. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, specified a bunch of methods for compiling this information, and the countries who signed up to Paris have agreed to use these specific spreadsheets to document what their emissions are. And the question is, how well can we do that? Well, for barrels of oil and tons of coal, it's pretty easy. But, you know, 
What do you do about 30 acres of land that got converted from rainforest to a soybean plantation? What's the emissions there, right? How do you actually measure that? Did somebody burn that 30 acres of, of rainforest and measure the CO2? No, they didn't. Did they weigh the trees? No, they didn't, right? So th there are many different parts of the stock take we want to do. That is very, very hard to do from a bottom-up statistical method. But why can't we just measure the carbon dioxide in the air? and then trace it back to its source by assimilating this carbon dioxide information into numerical models, the same ones we use for predicting our weather, for example, similar models to those. We assimilate the data in. And then we go and ask the question, where did that emission come from? Did it increase or decrease over time? We can ask these questions. And we do that. This is something we're actually, we've actually been doing. We've been, this is how we learn about the, the forest in Brazil or in, in, in Central Africa, right? So can we bring these into the kind of policy forefront and say, can we start using these as a management tool? Can we use them to assess the bottom-up inventories for completeness, for accuracy? Are we measuring the right things in the bottom-up inventories? We don't even know. But the top-down inventories from atmospheric measurements give us additional information on that. We only have OCO2 and GOSAT measurements of CO2. We only have tropomy measurements from Europe for methane and, and GOSAT measurements for methane from, from space at this point. But we're going to take the data that we've got, and we're going to put it in, build the best models that we have, and we're going to put the best estimates on the table to show people who are doing the bottom-up estimates what we can do and how it might be used with their product. So it's, these are two completely complementary systems that are being stacked up to help us understand how rapidly we're actually responding to reductions in greenhouse gas emissions to get this climate problem under control. OCO and GOSAT only sample about 1% of the Earth every month, and that's about all we get. We sample the atmosphere. Fortunately, the CO2 mixes really well in the atmosphere, and so a few samples is enough to teach you a lot. But wouldn't it be nice to measure every square lot, kilometer of the Earth every week or two, okay? New systems that are coming into place in Japan originally, with uh, first with GOSAT G, the GW mission launching in the 2024 timeframe, and then starting in 2025, the Europeans have an ambitious series, a uh, constellation of three spacecraft that will be mission, making measurements of carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrogen dioxide, a, a critical source of, of pollution. And they're going to use that information. The nitrogen dioxide tells you where the emission is coming from, if it's coming from a fossil fuel combustion source, right? And then NASA is going to be launching the GeoCarb mission, which will be a geostationary mission. It will stand over the Western Hemisphere here, here, looking at North and South America, taking measurements throughout the day of carbon dioxide, methane, and carbon monoxide. Why carbon monoxide? Well, that's put, uh, when you burn a forest down, you generate a lot more carbon monoxide than nitrogen dioxide. So it's a better tracer of that particular process. So we'll be able to watch the Western Hemisphere with this now experimental spacecraft. So we're moving in the direction of being able to measure more precisely the sources of emissions in sinks and potentially being able to assess the success of certain carbon offset projects. So we wanted to ask Anne-Marie, in her opinion, taking off her official hat, should we be focusing on expanding these offset markets before we have a way to measure whether they're really working, whether they're really pulling CO2 out of the air? As an engaged citizen and an interested scientist, I, you know, I read and think about how the future might unfold. And if we really do want to get to net zero emissions, how do we do that? Because as you mentioned, you have two levers. You could, you could just stop burning fossil fuels and that would make a, most of all of the change you need. Or you can try to have uptake mechanisms that are balancing out what you're emitting and get to a net zero. It's my opinion that really the focus and the energy needs to be on getting off of fossil fuels because you can only you're only going to boost carbon removal to a certain extent. There's real limits on what could ever be done in that arena in my opinion because of the nature of the the plants or carbon capture and storage etc. They're not like a, a unending reservoir. If you want to get net zero, you got to crank down what you're putting in the system as well as do what you can to enhance what you're taking out of the system. From my understanding of the situation, what we would really need is a, 
um, you know, so look at solar power, solar power, solar panels, the costs have just dropped dramatically. Now oil, right, when it used to be that uh, oil and gas were the only economically sensible choice, but that's not the case anymore. You've got solar and wind, they're highly competitive. So um, we just, we have to keep moving in that direction as well as efficiency. I think efficiency is maybe an under uh, utilized activity that if we can really improve the efficiency of uh, our homes, our, heat, our heating, our industry, all these things, you really reduce the utilization of, of power, whether it be renewable power or, or gas or oil power. That was Dr. Anne-Marie Eldering, Deputy Project Scientist for Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2 and Project Scientist for Orbiting Carbon Observatory 3, and Dr. David Crisp, Science Team Lead for OCO2 and 3. If you'd like to hear David's moving story of how the Orbiting Carbon Observatory project got started in the first place, check out our episode entitled Measuring CO2 from Space, A Journey of Perseverance, Heartbreak, and Scientific Breakthrough. That is it for this episode of the podcast. To check out more podcasts, our videos, and sign up for our newsletter, visit us at climatenow.com. To get in touch, email us at contact at climatenow.com or tweet at us at we are climate now. We hope you can join us for our next conversation. Mm -hmm.